It's easy to get lost. This is The Revenue Maze, and I'm Valerie Cobb. Join me as we navigate the halls, dead ends, and U-turns on our path towards upward growth trajectory. The Revenue Maze is sponsored by Lodestar URY, guidance and execution through fractional revenue leadership uncovering hidden revenue streams, and empowering small business growth through process-driven sales. It's so exciting to be on the Revenue Maze. Today's guest is da, 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 strategic marketing expert, host of the Hardcore Marketing Show, author of Marketing Automation Unleashed, the Strategic Path for B2B Growth, U.S. Marine Corps veteran, fractional chief marketing officer for several growth-oriented companies, founder and podcaster architect at Ringmaster Conversational Marketing, wait for it, Casey Cheshire. Welcome, Casey. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on this. I have listened. I am just honored to be on here and talking to you today. I am so excited for this show because you and I have a lot in common, growth-oriented companies. That's yes. what it's all about. Yes. But before we get into all of that, you know the title of the show is The Revenue Maze. And because of that, I need to ask you, and I need you to be real honest with the group and the listeners, <laughs> what is one thing? Just one thing that you can help assist small businesses getting out of the revenue maze. Absolutely. One of the main reasons we're stuck in the maze is that 90%, 90% of what we think we know about how and why our customers and prospects buy from us is complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> and we're actually just stringing along sale to sale, one unlucky moment from collapse. You don't actually know why they're buying at all. In fact, and I've been guilty of this. I'm in there. It's my own biases. I used to see a commercial and if it absolutely sucked, I thought that was a, that was a shitty investment, but I might not have been the audience. So we are full of all these biases. Why would you buy that software? Why would you make that purchase decision? You're not them. Even if you're a marketer selling to marketers, buying marketing software, you still may not be in the same seat that they are. Maybe you used to be there, but not anymore. So we have all these biases, all these, these errant thinking, all these thoughts that we just make up in our minds, all these crazy thoughts that say this is why they're buying, and it's not the case. We actually have no idea. Maybe you have 10% of an idea. It might be something completely different, and all we need to do to fix this is actually talk to our prospects, talk to our customers, and we're just doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. We think that talking to them is like a sales conversation. That's a different kind of conversation. We're not actually asking and giving them attention, and this drives me absolutely bonkers, and I can't stand it. <laughs> you mean our biases actually cause? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, oh, it's so aggravating. It's so I, I understand. I've been there and I, you know, I, I've been in that seat and I, I've been immature too and, and thought that I just knew what was best for my buyer, even if they were like completely different industry. And, you know, what, what do I know about, you know, a CIO's job, right? Or whatever software I'm selling. It, it, even, even if you were a CIO, you're, you're probably out of the loop and you may be better informed, but man, if, if you haven't been that buyer, you are really out of it and you got to take a step back and have a conversation. Okay. So I think we're all guilty of that a little bit, right? I mean, 100%. preconceived notions and biases. I, in fact, I'm laughing because my daughter wants me to buy a Subaru and I can't bring myself to do it because of a commercial that they have. It's really? What, what, what happened? Was it a shitty commercial? <laughs> you know, it, it just is. Sometimes it just feels so far out there, the Subaru ads, right? And, and it resonates with certain audiences. And of course, you're not going to get everybody. You're just not. I mean, that's just how it is, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can't envision myself in a Subaru due to that ad. Isn't that the right. funniest thing? And right. you and I've talked about this in the past. 
people buy for their reasons. That's it. Yes. Right. So yeah. tell us a little bit, Casey, give us a couple of pointers on how you've helped some of these growth companies that you're working for get out of that. I mean, yeah. that's really what you're doing, right? You're yeah. You know, it, tell it's, us about it. I it happened. It started with my own. I, I, I started a podcast, you know, very much like this one. And I just started talking to them and, and lo and behold, when I just shut up and listened for a second, um, I don't know. I heard this recently. I think it was Jordan Peterson said, you can listen or you can think, but you can't do both at the same time. Right. <laughs> and like, how telling is that? Sometimes and I've been guilty of this, even on a podcast or in a business meeting or having coffee with a customer and they're talking and I'm already thinking and I'm thinking while they're talking about either how I can leverage what they're talking about or what I'm going to say next or how my family's doing after the recent thing we did this weekend. Like, it, if I'm thinking, I'm not listening. And if I'm listening, I can do my thinking later, right? So it, we, we get into this. It's not just a matter of talk to the customer, right? And if I led with that, first of all, in this podcast, people would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, trite stuff. What a wimpy podcast. What a wimpy guest. Because he's just saying, talk to your customer. Everyone knows that. Yeah, everyone knows that, but we don't do it. And I think we don't do it for two reasons. One, we don't know how to get them in a situation where we can actually have this kind of a conversation. And, and it's, again, it's not a sales call where we're trying to get something from them, some sort of action. We're literally just trying to learn from them. We're, we're just literally trying to discover their thinking and their words and their process. All the good marketing comes from that. But, but how do you get them to sit down with you? And, and in some cases, it's just enough just to ask them and they'll just do it. But sometimes for us, that feels weird. Oh, it's, it's going to be weird. Are they, are they going to say no to my request? So we don't know how to get them in, in a situation. And then the second thing is once we get them and get their attention, either coffee or on a podcast or in just a, a Zoom call, we don't know what to ask them. We don't know what to say. We don't want to just kind of be staring at them like a first date, wondering if maybe they'll tell us something without us having to ask them that, right? So <laughs> these are the two problems that, that I experienced myself, right? So in, because of that, so many of us hide behind the technology, right? I did it in marketing. I know even in, you know, sales at least is having conversations, but sometimes they've got so many check boxes to address on the, on that sales call. You know, do I, you know, did I qualify this person? Did I, this, did I, that, that, and also sales can very much be focused in the moment. So you need some sort of either sales leadership or marketing leadership or someone to take a step back and say, I get it. All these deals are happening right now, but from a big picture, let's just talk to a customer, find out what are their problems? What are their challenges? Not that they have a dog and three cats and they like, and they don't like Subarus, right? But, but actually, you know, what was the thing that triggered the search in the first place? Why did you start looking for different vendors in this, in this regard? That's a great question to start with. Take me back in time to when this first came up and you're like, oh, geez, we need to look for something. Like what happened? Even finding that out is amazing. Uh, wow. You know, as I have trained, it, it's really interesting listening to understand is kind of, if I were going to summarize what you're saying right there is it's really key because, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, um, of Daniel Pink and to sell as human and people put a bad rap on sales because we don't listen or we've got an ulterior motive or we don't da, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you're really doing a sales job properly, your ultimate goal is to provide somebody with some value that takes some pain away. Right. I mean, I mean, that's when the kid runs out to the street and you stop them from running out to the street. Right. And it's just when you do exactly what you just said, it just creates a really great moment of, um, really showing why I got into sales to begin with, yeah, right. Yeah. Is to help people help people right. into something. Yeah. It's a great vocation for, uh, a lot of reasons, but, uh, sales team members get a lot of head trash over just product because they feel that feeling of I'm not helping somebody. It's not true to me. It's not this, not in the other. And if they just shut up and listen, Mm. instead of have the goal yeah. of doing like you're saying, if they would just shut up and listen and really listen to understand, then they do get at the root of 
what a person is really looking for, and then they become true to themselves, right? The salesman. Yeah. So the same as that. marketing, if you listen, you know, that's the whole point to position any kind of product or anything. You've got to be able to listen to the audience that is you're selling to for right. sure. I lo um, love that you mentioned the, the pain, right? The pain yeah. of, you know, you didn't get into sales to trick people into buying software. No. <laughs> well, I know some SaaS apps that that's almost a core value at this point, but, yeah. but you, that's not why you got into it. You wanted to help people. Maybe you want to make a lot of money or maybe do both at the same time, but either way it, it was like, let's, you can't all be in the, the, the peace core, but at least you can try to help somebody out who's experiencing pain. But then the question is like, what is the pain? And when you brought that up, I was thinking, yeah, what is the pain? That's one of the things we're trying to, find out and i think that's where biases come in place too we were making the software here's this cool feature we're guessing at the pain yeah. this reminds me of that old movie um kevin costner feel the dreams right oh yeah you know, like that voice is like ease his pain you know ease his pain and then you're like <laughs> he's like he's like who's pain what pain <laughs> <laughs> you stupid freaking cornfield give me a little <laughs> bit more than like ease his pain who where why what do i have to do and somehow he ends up going to boston come on fenway park went last night was amazing but like he goes there and I maybe mean, that's where the, the quote happens but either way it's like can you give me a little more than that um but, but and we got to listen we got to find out what is the actual pain that's causing that and that's why going back to the very beginning and saying tell me about you're just minding your own business doing your job and then it's like something's happening and you're like we got to look for this tool were you just winging it would something happen i had this great conversation with a brilliant woman named adele Ravella, and she is the author of buyer persona the book buyer persona and literally on my show i, I was an idiot and i was literally lot i was an idiot on live on video thinking that a buyer persona was like what HubSpot had told me it was. And I'm like, I just, it's just a cute. Isn't it? No, it's not. I'm just it, teasing you. You know, Keep like, going. no, I know. But like, it, oh, you know, this is, this is a marketing Mary. She has cats. She likes puppies. And, you know, she's probably in her mid thirties and blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's more of a buyer um, profile. And you can't do too much with that, right? But if you're talking about a buyer persona, we want to know what made Mary buy, what made her search for in the first place, and then how does she buy? And if you can answer those questions alone, and, and beautiful, Adele Ravella, her book, you should check that out. But she schooled me on this, and I realized if you do it wrong, you have zero actionable in, info, right? So the idea of if I, okay, I know Mary likes cats. Who cares? What do I do? Offer kitty litter as a part of the deal? Like, what do I do with that? <laughs> But, but if you know that, right, the trigger for, for marketing Mary was that her boss was like, I need you to get your leads increased by a thousand percent or you're going to get fired or something. Okay. Now what happened? What happened before that? Well, well, in the organization, we had a downturn. Okay. And like, we know that this happened and now we can seek other companies out her having the same kind of situation and proactively be there for them when they're ready. Right. So a thousand ideas come from that. And all we had to do was ask marketing Mary and all of her cohorts and all of her friends. Tell me about that time when that need first came came to mind, right? And that's just one question, but you can see there's so much action that could come from that to ease their pain. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you bring up something really interesting to me, and that is the subject of even AI in being able to do that in a marketing set, set situation. You know, a lot of us are, are big on what we would call account-based marketing, which is especially in business to business. We're not selling business to consumer, typically we're selling to other businesses, right? And when we talk about trying to map that journey, because that's kind of what you said, this is how, why they're buying this way. This is, you know, all the stuff behind it. I just, it's just mind boggling, even the workflows and everything to pull that up and have a small business become profitable at identifying that it's much easier to just take a demographic they are this age to this age this revenue to this revenue to this to this but actually trying to map how somebody behaves 
<laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. It, it's, it's part of the reason I, I, I am a Trek fan. I am tech fan. I am everything. I struggle with how machine learning or AI is going to bridge that gap, but that may be for a whole nother podcast, but I'm just curious your thoughts on something like yeah, that. I think we're both going to come across as troglodytes on this episode, but you know <laughs> what? Uh, I, tech, I, I like to say connect before tech, right? <laughs> You got to connect with your prospects, your customers, ask them these questions long before you do tech. Otherwise, what does tech do? It just makes whatever bad, shitty marketing sales service you were doing 10 times worse because now it's in front of that many more people in their face, annoying them, getting spam. And all the and people now know 10 times more clearly that you don't know anything about them thanks to these tools. So yeah, it, it, the, these are like effectively silver bullet distractions from us. I love that and silver bullet connect. distractions. <laughs> got to connect before tech. Exactly. <laughs> so, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about connecting. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's talk about connecting. Let's talk because obviously your podcast has helped with that and sifted through what I call the digital minutia, right? They get to know yes. a little bit more about your personality and things like that. So yeah, let's talk about connecting. Go ahead. So so he, here's the thought, right? How do we get them to have a conversation with us? Mm -hmm. And, and you, know, you mentioned ABM and I've been doing marketing for so long. <laughs> ABM right now is like the emperor's new clothes. It's like a shell game. It's a, just another thing. And you know what? Uh, it disguises the game that's being played. That game that marketing is playing is the notice me game, right? Yeah. So all this, all this decoration aside, we're trying to say notice me. Right. Yeah. And then even with ABM, it all still comes down to a game called get on the phone with me. Right now, notice me that 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 can be such a challenge. I had a friend come to me who was um, potentially going to do some sales for the SaaS startup. And he was saying, oh, they're looking for CIOs and this is how they proceed. And and you know, he was like, well, what do you think? What would a good marketing, you know, you know, one year look like to you, one year, two year, how do you get their attention and all that? How do you play the notice me game? Right. Was his question essentially. And I had to think, well, okay. Traditionally speaking. Okay. A lot of events, we're going to spend heavy to be at these events, all the right places. Mm -hmm. Notice me, notice my big booth, notice my fleece blanket giveaway. Notice me, notice me. Um, we're going to try to harass them to notice me. We're going <laughs> to send them the socks of their alma mater and, <laughs> Yes. ABM terms, right? We're going to notice me, right? Yeah. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of money over two years. And hopefully that CIO who is who he was going after will notice them or at least have heard of them. That doesn't mean they even have a, a problem to solve for them. They just will notice them. Very expensive, right? Status quo of marketing and sales, play the notice me game. And then we get, but either way, you got to play the get on the phone with me game, which we'll get to in a second. So, so I then thought, well, you know what? I've I've been experimenting with with podcasting, and I've I've had so many amazing conversations uh, with my last agency. I, I, I was looking for uh, CMOS that had a particular technology tool, right? Had Pardot, you know, and and so I would just interview them. I just asked them, hey, would you be on the show? And then sometimes we just we make a great connection on that show. We'd learn a lot from each other. We build some trust with each other, and then some deals accidentally started happening, right? I made this podcast just to have conversations and learn from people and make content. And that all happened, of course. But I got off the, a, a call with this, um, this CMO, super badass uh, leader. Um, and, and she's just brilliant. She was schooling me the whole time. I loved it. Um, and then after the call, we're not recording anymore. And she mentioned, you know, my team is moving from Marketo to Pardot, right? And that is exactly what my agency did nothing but right that was what we specialized in it was like well holy crap that's what we do we can help you out <laughs> we can do this and she's like well great you saved me from trying to find someone i can trust i trust you uh let's talk let's get our teams talking we got our teams talking like barely was even a sales cycle because we got our teams connected and like an eighty thousand dollar migration deal came out of that and and i wasn't seeking that out and just happened. So I thought, what happens if I actually seek that out, right? What happens if I if I make my audience my ideal customer profile, right? If I make my audience the ideal person I want to talk to. Um, now, playing the old school game, getting those CIOs would be that that notice me game for two years, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Instead, I realized, man, my, my friend, we could get a little podcast going and we could get those CIOs on a call within weeks, right? It's like, why would I ever go back and do that old school method when I can do this new school method, when I can just have a podcast conversation with someone and then that second game, which is get on the phone with me, which by the way, no one wants to get on the phone with you. So we have to kind of trick and cajole them or even just force them to get on the phone with me and then they resent it, right? So the, the second game, even if you're doing ABM, it doesn't matter. You still are stuck doing the get on the phone with me game. And there's and socks don't magically make people want to get on the phone, right? So, but what does make <laughs> people magically get on the phone is a podcast. And the difference is, we're giving them attention and we're not trying to take their time, right? We're not trying to take time out of their calendar. We're trying to give them time out of our calendar. And there's this brilliant guy um, and he had Dan Sullivan. He has this quote, everyone's competing to get your attention, but no one's competing to give you attention. And that's what a podcast does. It says, look, it's not about me. I want to learn from you. I want to give you my attention. Come be featured on the show. And who says no to that, Right. And so it's like, okay, I'll get on the phone with you. That's why that CEO or that, that CIO or wh whoever you're trying to, the CMO, is, it's like, yeah, I'd love to have a marketing strategy conversation. With you. Let's do it, right? That's why I'm here. I'd love to have a conversation about this topic. I'm here. Let's go. And, and that's how you skip those games of notice me and of call me by simply inviting someone to be on a podcast. Yeah, I love that because that has been sort of the sift through the minutia kind of, you know, thing. And if you really are trying to help people, giving them attention is, is helping, right? I mean, highlighting them. When, um, when I invite guests on my podcast, I'm like, listen, this is all about you. This is not about me. Yeah. This is you what, didn't name it the Valerie show. I didn't I mean, name it the Valerie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is, this is all about you. Um, and helping you. I, I had, uh, somebody who came to me for my services and I said, you know, honestly, right now you need a lot of PR. And so what I can do is have you on my podcast and that will help you, but I can't help you right now with what you're doing. I don't want to end up, selling you something that's just not going to work. Right? right. So, right. Um, and it's also why I do a sales audit for people first, you know, it's right. like, if we don't fit and I can't help you, I will make sure that I direct you in the right direction if nothing else. Right. So when you are, when you are saying that you are putting them on there on your podcast to have it be about them, your help, at the base level of the mantra of, Hey, there's certain products and services that help people out. And this can help you that checks all the boxes, right. Of being right. A, what we call Catherine Brown's being a good human. Right? Yeah. You're, you're really yeah. being a good human. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and you know what, when they come on the show and you've done a little prep in advance and you've got them ready to rock that thing, they come out swinging. You ask them that first question and they're just nailing it and they look like a rock star, right? <laughs> so good. And then they're going to want to share it with their tribe and with their network on LinkedIn. And it's not like you're pulling a fast one over them because you literally are featuring them and yeah. you're being good human, right? You're like putting someone in the spotlight. <laughs> And that feels really good too. That feels really good to be able to help people that way. And so to your point in sales, you're just trying to provide a little value to help them give them information, however you can help them attack this pain, right? So this comes into the next point. Well, how do we discover that pain? So that first question isn't about pain. You don't lead in with nice to meet you. What ails you, right? We're not, exactly. we're not positioned, <laughs> right? And also people are very reticent to talk about that kind of thing on a podcast, at least right out of the gate. So right out of the gate, first question is like, tell me something you are passionate about and you totally kick ass at that everyone else that listens to this show can totally learn from you, right? But then later on during the show, you can ask questions like, what is your biggest challenge or what keeps you up at night? Um, I often like to ask a question uh, for my agency where I would say, tell me about marketing automation. And I, and I know the speaker I'm talking to has part up. I don't need to get weird on them, right? Yeah. Keep it level. So I'm like, tell me, what's your take on marketing automation? And then people would tell me, people will tell you, you know what? I love it. I hate it. I've never quite gotten to work. Our team is so frustrated with it. We're looking at migrating. We're looking to do this and that. And guess what? 
now I know their pain, right? Now there's plenty more pain and you can have offline conversations. Maybe you're leaving too sensitive for recordings, but now you've got a sense for when you're done the conversation, I would often follow up and say, I heard you have a challenge with this terrible thing. I know they keep changing the tech on you. Someone on my team's an expert. Let's connect it with your person. Let's get them chatting, right? And let's sure. just see if we can solve this. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what happens when I have people even on, on this podcast. I learn wonderful things about each one of them. And then I think, oh, wow, this person could use this. And you've all of a sudden connected with, with them and said, hey, I can't, maybe I can't help you, but I can connect you with three people who can help you. Right. And totally. Um, and then maybe the listeners are going, wait, I could help this person and do the same thing. Right. And so I love that. So how did you get here, Casey? I mean, right? you didn't arrive overnight in, in discovery. Well, can, can I, can I actually just throw a wrench in your, in your machine real quick and maybe embarrass you for a second. Okay. One of the things you mentioned about, you know, doing the audit or, you know, having these conversations and, and if you can't help people, then you're not going to force feed them your service, right? Or you're not going to yeah. try to trap people. That is like the sign of anyone who does that should be a marker for all of us of like, this is someone you can trust and, and you should find a way to work with them because the number of people you can trust, you know, vendor wise is very limited, at least really trust them. So a podcast is a great start, but nothing like a podcast and then having someone tell you, you're not ready for my services yet, or you need this other thing first. Did, did that cost me a hundred grand? Maybe, but I don't, I don't want, I don't want your money. I want you to see you do better. Right. So a shout out to you. Oh. you know, I've worked with you a few times in the past and you are just an amazing sales leader. So if anyone needs fractional sales leadership, you are the one to go with. And I know this is your show. So I'm going to shut up and tell you about me, but like, I, I just wanted this, to say, this is about yeah. you, Casey. It is, it is about me. <laughs> yeah. I can't help myself, but yeah. I know, I know it's kind of like <laughs> the dance of there's such great things going on. You, you got to shout it out. And I, totally. I totally agree. I, I feel like there's so much out there that are, is helping just organizations and those things. And sometimes they're just not highlighted enough that people see it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I've been, especially with like Jed Blount, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. He doesn't even know who I am. Yeah, Jed. <laughs> yeah, Jed. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the law of familiarity, um, fanatical prospecting, you know, it, it really is, it, part of the minutia of the familiarity is the digital deluge of information that's out there and then trying to narrow down who you can trust. And you can't tell somebody, trust me, because that's the red flag that says, don't trust this person. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Trust <laughs> me, you'll be fine. The car is perfect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure, bro. <laughs> I love totally. it. There's your theater coming out in it. <laughs> Yeah, right. Can't help myself. We're going to start breaking out into Joseph later on. You'll see. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Joseph is everyone. amazing. Donnie Osmond. I That's had a it. friend. I digress. I had a friend. I <laughs> We lived in the Cayman Islands and I was coming back to the United States and she had a record, a record. And it was Donnie Osmond. And she's like, could you get it signed for me? And I opened it up to my network back in the day. It was 2000. This, there was no LinkedIn, no anything. I opened it up to my network and I got that signed by Donnie Osmond for her. <laughs> You're amazing. That's, that's incredible. That is so cool. I don't even know Donnie Osmond, but. <laughs> you should, you should. He should. I should shout, I hey, should. Donnie, reach out. You need some, you know, you need you guys. Can <laughs> you need to connect. some love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys need to connect for sure. So. Anyways, I digress. You're were, you were saying, tell me your story and all these things. So yeah. How'd you um, get here? I'm yeah, curious. Did, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I've always been a little bit one of those, you know, I don't say rule breaker, but like, is there an easier way to do this? Is there a, a more efficient way to do this? And then also um, what's fun. And, and it really is a sort of combination of passions. And I was always a little bit technical and a little bit of a communicator and, and so I loved computers and I loved um, communicating and, and just connecting with people. And, and I was actually a magician when I was a kid um, and, and I did magic shows. Um, Trust me, but sleight of the hand. 
for the, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And then make make cards appear out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, I just I loved you know reading and learning and learning secrets like magic tricks and but also the fact that it would just really delight people. So I always loved doing that. But then I was also a bit of a business person as well because I would um, I would perform magic shows for birthday parties and I of course would charge for that. And man, would parents pay, you know, and I thought $50 was like a, a lot of money for it probably was. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, it, but parents were like, Oh, please, if I take them to fun world, it's going to be 300. Yeah, here, here, take your 50 bucks clown, you know, but, um, but yeah, it, so I always enjoyed the sort of the business aspect of it, but also the performance aspect. And then um, as tech sort of, you know, grew and grew uh, for us, then I'm, I, I was around just before that became a thing. Um, and so as that came into play, I loved how tech could connect us with people. So for me, the even the idea of America Online was just a matter of connecting with someone. Um, and it was it was fascinating. Uh, a funny secret. I back in the day, <laughs> anyone who was there, um, America Online used to charge for the Internet. Right. The yes, internet yes, yes. <laughs> and by the hour. Right. Which AOL. is crazy to think about now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So. But, you know, if you needed tech support, you can go to the tech support chat and then they stopped your billing per hour because obviously you were getting tech support. So I would go to the tech support room and chat with people there because it was free um, and it didn't count against my hours. But, yeah, it, it was just it was a matter of just uh, connecting with people. So as long as the short is I went to school wondering, do I like computers or I like communications? I did both. Um, and I was always sort of trying and experimenting with things and you know, trying different jobs. I once had someone tell me my resume looked like a circus clown. Mine right? does too. <laughs> well, the joke's on them because I'm ringmaster.com now. So what's up? It totally looks like it, right? It's like, hello, full circle. But at the same time, uh, it just, it all was it, we are connecting with people and then learning how to use tech um, to measure that connection. A little bit creative, a little bit analytical. Yeah. And, and you are, and that's amazing. And your history has definitely shown that. So, yeah, yeah. um, I can't imagine because even when we were, when I was going down your, you know, your intro and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you, you were part of the Marines and you have had, you've written a book and you have this, this production company for, with Ringmaster. And I think you do a great job of having people feel like they really are listened to, you know? And, and, and I think that that's kind of brought you here, but some of the guests would like to know more about kind of you and what makes you tick. Like, you know, yeah. what you talked about your passions. We kind of threw in and laced in a little bit of theater i think i heard you yeah, say theater. that you're you were or still are in part of part of theater tell us a little bit about you know yeah the things. theater side i mean i grew up doing theater and there was something about it i always loved it and it, and it actually ha happened by accident this is kind of a funny fifth grade story um i was in fifth grade and i was nobody special at least in my own mind i was just fifth grader and um, in, the, in the school, the fifth grade had a fifth grade play and, and everyone in the fifth grade was going to be in it. And it was this cool play with, there was maybe like seven main characters, seven or eight main characters. And then there were these different scenes where all different other people of different classes would come in and sing songs and do things. Um, and then the seven characters would get back together again and, and connect all the scenes together. Um, and, and there was a the cool kid part. And of course I auditioned for that. <laughs> and didn't get it <laughs> yeah um, uh, no. but you know what they 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 actually gave me like the main lead of the whole show oh. um and I was in essentially it was kind of like this nerd it was kind of like I was like the white Urkel right <laughs> so I was this like nerd kid and I tried wearing glasses or whatnot it didn't quite work but mostly I had just like my dockers nice and high so suspenders and a collared shirt <laughs> and I was just like I don't uh, was it typecast? I don't know, but I was being just silly me and I would rehearse with my dad and we kind of had some ad lib jokes that, that, um, that I would throw out there. Like we told these kids, like, I'm going to take them to help them do their school report, uh, that they waited too long to finish. And I'd already finished mine. Of course. Um, that's not typecast. Uh, it's so, uh, I would hand out blindfolds. I'm like, I have to take you to my secret computer lab. 
here's some blindfolds. And I handed out seven blindfolds to seven classmates. And at the end, I was like, well, what do you know? Just enough, right? <laughs> totally ad-libbed. And then the whole gymnasium, all the parents just are just erupting in laughter. And so that was just the start of like, huh, I, I can kind of control this whole audience and make them all laugh and make them all smile. Um, but who would have thought like, you know, I would, it was kind of the nerd part, but it was like the part. And it, it wasn't so much the attention from everyone else, just the fact that like, wow. And then of course, the next year, what was I in Peter Pan? Was I Peter Pan? No, no, no. I was Indian number 27, right? <laughs> So, so it wasn't like it was this grand, you know, ascent to, uh, to theatrical winning. This was, but it was a first touch of like, this is fun. I could really do this throughout my life. Yeah. Yeah. I can just imagine a Casey at fifth grade doing, <sighs> doing this and making everybody laugh. I, I just, when you were, when you were talking about that, uh, my daughter was just reminding me that she was in a school play at about, I, it was more, it was more, I think first or second grade, but she was, her class did Joseph and the amazing Technicolor uh. Dreamcoat. And she was the kissing, <laughs> you know, she was Pharaoh's, she was the wife, right? She was and, the wife, wow. Not, I'm sorry, Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's Anyways, wife. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. And, um, anyways but you know she ran around with these big lips like oh, holding big lips you know and and she told me how that embarrassed her so bad in front of all of the friends <laughs> and we were just like we all thought it was so cute and uh yeah that's, that's yeah because boys funny. were gross back then yeah boys are yeah. gross but also remember you didn't want to draw the attention of anybody who's going to make fun of you and right. she was running around with this big red lips and of course these i wasn't in charge of it but these you know dingy parents feel like well that's just going to be perfect and they didn't <laughs> think about yeah. these little kids but um it was she was darling in it and i i can just envision you running around and in, in your suspenders and your pants way up and the steve urkel kind of <laughs> yeah right so good it was just a lot of fun. And, you know, and when I think about the different parts that sort of stood out to me, another time I was the villain of this, um, like, uh, prohibition era show called The Drunkard, right? Oh. And it was like a musical, but at the same time, it was, it was weird because uh, there'd be people on the side of the stage that would hold up signs that said boo and hiss or cheer and applause. Oh, yeah. And so when the heroes came out, they would do that and the audience would play along and they're like, hooray. And they, each character had a theme song. So when you came out, they'd play, oh, the hero, the heroine, you know, is, there's here. And then for me, I was the villain. So they'd play my dun, 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 dun. And then everyone would be like, boo, hiss. And I'd come out and I'd scowl at the audience. And then, you know, with my top hat and cane. And, and so it was just, I, I just loved entertaining people. And, and I found that, you know, later on in life, um, you know, marketing and all these things, webinars have my attention, but then really podcasts click for me, where is a way to it, you still be on a stage in a way, right? Like we're, we're connected here. We're having a one-to-one -one conversation. This is so great about this whole methodology too. People can be connecting with their ideal customer in, in a, and no one's on their phone, right? You and I, we can't do it. Like we couldn't manage to have a conversation. I mean, we said you're either thinking or you're listening well nowhere in that sentence is you're on your phone you're checking your email how many times have we done sales calls or other calls where prospects are just literally checking their email i've done it i should have I, I, like i've tried to cut it short but they want to show me the stupid saw i don't want to see it anymore i'm on my email <laughs> right but when you're on a on a one-on-one -on -one interview like this you're giving them your attention they there's respect and they give it back to you yeah yeah no that's that's awesome. So, well, Casey, this has been an amazing episode. I have been just thoroughly entertained, but I 100% believe getting out of the res revenue maze is listening, definitely <laughs> listening. <laughs> and uh, I, I just have loved every moment of it. So tell us a little bit about where our listeners can actually find you. Uh, connect with you. If nothing else, they'll have a great entertaining <laughs> time with it. Um, yeah. Tell us where they can get with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as you mentioned that, that listening is the key to get out of the maze. It, in my mind, I thought like you're in the revenue maze, 
literally someone is telling you how to get out, right? Yeah. It's like your customer's literally saying this way, this is where, and it's like, I'm not, no, no, sh stop. I'm, 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 I got this, you know, it's like, no, just listen people. And then literally you and this podcast are telling people how to get out of the maze as well. So it's like, we just need to stop for a second, listen to a podcast like this, listen to our customers and launching a podcast is the way to do that. So the best way to get in touch with me. Um, so a couple ways, one is email super direct Casey at ringmaster.com. Um, shoot me an email. Hey, this podcast thing sounds interesting. Um, how does it work? How do you track the ROI? Because yes, I mean, we can get into that. That's a whole nother show, but there is a hundred percent trackability with podcasting ROI. And, and actually one deal closing pays for the whole thing for a year, right? So it's like, it's pretty impressive um, the way it works out like that. But yeah, shoot me an email, Casey at ringmaster.com. Obviously ringmaster.com is the web address to check out some of the other shows we have. My shows are on there, other shows. Uh, this show, which is fantastic, is on there. So uh, check out all the shows, you know, and have a conversation. That would be my, my, my suggestion is let's have a conversation. Let's talk about who you're trying to talk to. That's the only thing you have to prepare or to think about before you, you talk with a team like myself or my team is just who, who's your dream? Who would you just dream to have on a call? And then let's go out and get them on there for you. Let's go get them on the show for you. That's what the team does. So anyways, that's my email, my web address, my, my podcasts are called the hardcore marketing show. Um, your episode is still one of the most popular on the show. I'd encourage people to check that out. Maybe we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And then there's another show I have called leadership in action, talking to other CEOs of different companies. Um, and yeah, LinkedIn is always a great place as well. And I, you know, I would encourage people final thing is if you like this podcast, you're listening to this now, go and rate it, go and review it, give a shout out, um, you know, to Valerie, she's doing a great job and we got to get out of the maze. And the only way to do that is together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And for all the listeners on the revenue maze, I love this show and just Casey Cheshire. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you again. Absolutely. My pleasure. So there you all have it. This is another episode of the Revenue Maze. As Casey said, go on, like it. If you want more content, want to reach out, uh, you can uh, connect with us on LinkedIn under the Revenue Maze. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you all for joining another great episode. For show notes, links, and resources, visit RevenueMaze.com. And never forget, you are why 